Patty Smith begins her autobiography, Just Kids, by recounting an episode of naming from her childhood. She says, when I was very young, my mother took me for walks in Humboldt Park along the edge of the Prairie River. I have vague memories like impressions on glass plates of an old boathouse, a circular band shell, and arch stone bridge. The narrows of the river emptied into a wide lagoon, and I saw upon its surface a singular miracle. A long, curving neck rose from a dress of white plumage. Swan, my mother said, sensing my excitement. It pattered the bright water, flapping its great wings, and lifted into the sky. The word alone hardly attended to its magnificence, nor conveyed the emotion it produced. The sight of it generated an urge I had no words for, a desire to speak of the swan, to say something of its whiteness, the explosive nature of its movement, and the slow beating of its wings. The swan became one with the sky. I struggled to find words to describe my own sense of it. Swan, I repeated, not entirely satisfied. And I felt a twinge, a curious yearning, imperceptible to passerby, my mother, the trees, or the clouds. Smith's account highlights a number of features integral to the act of naming. We inhabit a world of wonders that present themselves to us, a world of singular miracles with long curving necks that rise from white dresses of plumage. Part of our participation in this world of wonders involves naming those wonders. In naming the sensible and intelligible goods the world presents to us, we identify them, swan. However, acts of identification are not exhaustive of what we do in naming the wonders that the world presents to us. We identify, Paul Ricoeur observes, with a view to describing more. Beyond the act of identifying the world's sensible and intelligible goods, we also attempt, if only feebly, to attest their magnificence and to convey the emotion they produce within us, to say something of their whiteness, the explosive nature of their movement, the slow beating of their wings. Naming, furthermore, is a social activity an exercise in what philosophers call shared intentionality with respect to the wonders that present themselves to us. A singular miracle captures a daughter's attention and her mother introduces her to its name, drawing upon a common stock of language furnished with a common stock of classifications. Naming is a social activity in which we identify, describe, and evaluate common objects of love by means of a common language. The theme of the present lectures is not the magnificence of a swan, but the majesty of our God and the manifold names by which he presents his majestic being to us in Holy Scripture. A few words by way of introduction to our theme are in order. According to the Lutheran theologian, Johann Gerhard, our knowledge of God in this life is almost completely grammatical. What does this mean? Strictly speaking, God cannot be named. This is not because God's being is opaque, unintelligible, or unutterable. God is a supremely intelligible good. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. The Father knows and names the Son. The Son knows and names the Father, whose being he perfectly expresses as the Father's eternal word. And the Spirit searches the infinite depths of their mutual knowledge in mutual naming. God cannot be named, categorized, or evaluated according to the ordinary grammar of human naming because his glory categorically transcends the worldly wonders that the ordinary grammar, the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming is designed to identify, sort, and evaluate. The greatness of the Lord is unsearchable. The glory of the Lord is beyond all blessing and praise. God dwells in unapproachable light. Nevertheless, because the depths of God are also depths of love, God condescends to name himself in human language, taking up the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming and thereby conveying something of his transcendent being, character, and worth. The, 
According to Francis Turretin, because all our knowledge begins with a name, God assumes various names in scripture to accommodate himself to us. It is for this reason, because God assumes these various names, that our knowledge of God is almost completely grammatical. Our knowledge of God is the knowledge by names. Well, the manner of God's self-presentation to us in scripture thus sets the agenda of theological study. On the one hand, if our knowledge of God in this life is almost completely grammatical, we must devote ourselves to what Gerhard calls devout meditation on those things that have been revealed about God in scripture. As Basil of Caesarea affirms, not one of the words that are applied to God in every use of speech should be left uninvestigated. Indeed, according to Basel, the investigation of syllables does not fall outside the goal of our calling. On the other hand, we must avoid what Gerhard calls the rash investigation of matters that have not been revealed. Since the divine benevolence has revealed to us what it was expedient for us to know, John of Damascus counsels us, let us be content and in them let us abide and let us not step over the ancient bounds or pass beyond the divine tradition handed down to us by the law and the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists. This will then be the focus of our two lectures, how God presents himself to us in Holy Scripture by means of divine names and how we may, with magnanimity and moderation, learn to appropriate the divine names in prayer proclamation and praise. In the first lecture, we'll consider the nature, scope, and ends of divine naming. And in the second lecture, we'll consider the broader context within which divine naming makes sense. Guided by the conviction that good dogmatics derives from and leads to biblical exegesis, we will begin each lecture with a brief analysis of a particular text of Holy Scripture that will set the agenda for our theological reflections. We'll also conclude each lecture, if I manage my time wisely, with a particular text of Holy Scripture, attempting to demonstrate the fruits of theological reflection for biblical interpretation and Christian piety. So first, bless his holy name, the nature, scope, and ends of divine naming. Revelation four through five opens the door to a vision of what John Baer calls monarchical monotheism a vision in which God is seen as presiding over the heavenly court in the celebration of the heavenly liturgy. The heavenly court is the place where the reign of the triune God is visibly manifest, where the worship of the triune God is worthily expressed, and whence the purposes of the triune God for creation as a whole are both revealed and enacted. We may appreciate this text instruction for theology of the divine names by considering first what it says about the course of divine naming, and second, what it says about the character of divine naming. So first, the course of divine naming. John's vision begins with the summons of Jesus' voice. Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And verse two of chapter four says that John receives this vision in the spirit. And this shows us that the origin of divine naming is the triune God himself, revealing himself to and through the apostolic embassy of John to the seven churches. Revelation 45 goes on to present what from the vantage point of classical reformed theology is the consummate expression of human praise of God and thus of human naming of God, that of the glorified saints in heaven. In opening the door to God's heavenly court, Revelation 4 through 5 opens the door to the chorus of heavenly creatures and redeemed saints who have learned in the spirit and by virtue of the triumph of the lamb to praise the name of the thrice holy God with perfect eloquence. By showing us the human praise of God in this consummate form, Revelation 4 through 5 thus sets the standard and goal for pilgrims who are still on the way to our everlasting rest that we might gain by the same spirit and by virtue of the same triumph of the lamb, the fluency required to make us fitting participants in that heavenly chorus. While the heavenly creatures perfectly hallow God's name in view of his eternal sovereign being, 
And while they perfectly praise God's name because of his works of creation and providence, the revelation of a scroll, a scroll in God's right hand suggests to John that all is not well in the heavenly vision. The scroll likely signifies God's sovereign plan for creation as a whole. A purpose which we can infer both from the immediate context of Revelation 4 through 5 and from the broader context of scriptural allusions which this text evokes, especially Isaiah 6 in this case. In short, God's sovereign plan for creation as a whole is that not only in heaven, but also on earth, that God's name will be hallowed, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the glory with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covered the sea, to use the language of Isaiah 11. The problem, according to Revelation 5.3, is that no one in heaven, or on earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one, among all God's creatures, is worthy of understanding or affecting God's purpose for creation as a whole. And for this reason, John weeps. However, John's sorrow is quickly assuaged when one of the heavenly beings announces glad tidings. There's preaching apparently in heaven. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. John then looks and sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain who proceeds to take the scroll from God's right hand. John then hears the heavenly creature sing a new song, extolling the triumph of the lamb. The triumph of the lamb is thus a triumph of divine naming. In ransoming a kingdom of priests for God, the lamb has invested a people with the authority to lead all creatures in the praise of the triune God, thus fulfilling God's sovereign plan for all creation. As a result of the lamb's triumph and the ensuing authorization of this kingdom of priests, God's purpose for creation as a whole is thus realized. Not only myriads of myriads and thousands of, thousands of angelic hosts in heaven, but also every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them begin by the Spirit to render praise to God and to the Lamb. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Revelation 4 and 5 not only reveals something about the course of divine naming, it also reveals something about the character of divine naming. Though we are sometimes lulled into thinking that God's use of the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming means that God is just one more item, perhaps even the greatest item within the realm of creaturely being, Revelation 4 through 5 alerts us against this line of thinking. Apocalyptic literature deploys ordinary language in extraordinary ways. In so doing, it reminds us that God, in taking up the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming, seeks to convey something of his transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and holiness. Revelation 4 through 5 exhibits three features regarding the character of divine naming that we will expand upon more fully below. First, the nature of divine naming. Revelation 4 and 5 does not locate God among the world's panoply of creatures, but instead locates him above all creatures, identifying him as the one who sits on the throne. It also locates him at the center of all creatures, encircled by four living creatures, by 24 elders, and by the heavenly expanse that separates heaven and earth. In locating God at the center of all things, the text thus identifies God as the one from whom and to him, to whom all things in nature, grace, and glory proceed as their alpha and omega, their beginning and their end. Revelation 4 and 5 also identifies God by means of his unique divine name, the Lord God Almighty. In this case, a Greek surrogate for the Hebrew proper name and title, Yahweh Sabaoth. And by means of his eternal sovereign being as the one who was and is and is to come. Revelation 4 through 5, moreover, ascribes various attributes of God, including his power and his knowledge. And these chapters also exhibit praise to God in various ways, by means of trisagion, various doxologies, and the new song that celebrates the triumph of the Lamb. 
Note also the scope of divine naming. While Revelation 4 through 5 names God in manifold ways, it shows us that the extent of divine naming extends to God's being, attributes, persons, works, and worship. Revelation 4 through 5 is, to borrow Walter Brueggemann's language, God's name fully uttered. The end of divine naming then is also indicated in John 4 through 5 in the praise of all creatures. Well, in, in the remaining part of this lecture, I want to focus on these three elements of divine naming, the nature of divine naming, the scope of divine naming, and the ends of divine naming. So first, the nature of divine naming. God presents himself to us in Holy Scripture by deploying the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in an extraordinary way, thereby conveying something of his transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and worth. As we noted in the introduction, the world presents to us a series of sensible and intelligible goods that we, as intelligent creatures, find ourselves seeking to identify sort and evaluate according to various hierarchies of value and worth. Language is essential to the distinct activities of identifying, classifying, and evaluating the various wonders that the world presents to us. It is only in naming various goods that we are able to receive them, enjoy them, share them, and rejoice in them. Well, naming thus understood involves several paradigmatic activities. In naming, we identify things. We refer to this tree, this cheeseburger, or this man, singling things out as individuals within a larger world of sensible and intelligible goods. In naming, we also predicate properties of the various things we identify. We say that this tree is tall, that this cheeseburger is stale, or that this man is an astronaut. In naming, furthermore, we also evaluate things. We affirm that this tree looks great in our backyard, that this is the best or worst cheeseburger we've ever eaten, or that this man is terrible at hanging towel rods, an utterance that has been spoken in this world before, and I won't say of whom. These paradigmatic activities, in turn, are ordered to one another. When we conclude that this one is a human being, a someone, rather than a something, we discern not only the class of beings within which they belong, we also discern the obligation we owe them. While we may use a hammer, a person we may not. The ver these various paradigmatic acts of naming in turn may be performed using various linguistic operators. So for example, we may identify someone by a proper name, Neil Armstrong, or by a demonstrative, this man, or by means of a definite description, the first man to walk on the moon. Furthermore, in naming, we perform various speech acts. We may assert, Neil Armstrong is an astronaut. We may question, is Neil Armstrong an astronaut? We may command, Neil Armstrong, become an astronaut. And we may exclaim, Neil Armstrong, what an astronaut. Each of these speech acts, moreover, have different conditions for success. They take different stances on the relationship between word and world. Well, as we noted above, God deploys this ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in revealing himself to us. Scripture identifies God by his proper name, Yahweh, by various titles, such as God Almighty and God Most High, and by means of definite descriptions, such as the one who was and is and is to come, as the one who brought Israel out of Egypt, and as the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Scripture, moreover, predicates various things of God, employing a wide array of verbs adjectives and nouns. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yahweh is gracious and merciful. Yahweh is king. Scripture also evaluates God, extolling his greatness, honoring his majesty, and thanking him for his benefits. In each instance, however, Scripture deploys the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming in an extraordinary way thereby conveying something of God's transcendent uniqueness, incomparability, and worth. As Basel again affirms, although the spirit has often made use of various forms of creaturely discourse, he is in no way enslaved to those forms, but rather changes its expressions to suit its need for the moment. 
So when it comes to God's proper name, Yahweh, Churton states that this name is so peculiar to God as to be altogether incommunicable to creatures. In other words, no creature receives this proper name. Unlike creatures, God's proper name does not function to distinguish him as an individual member of a larger class or a larger species. Yahweh is God's peculiar and separate name, the name by which he is distinguished and set apart from all creatures and from all so-called gods. Similarly, in predicating various things of God, scripture employs the ordinary grammar of naming in extraordinary ways. It predicates certain actions exclusively to God alone, such as the works of creation and providence, redemption and consummation. Moreover, when it does predicate things commonly of God and creatures, scripture doesn't fail to emphasize both the uniqueness of God's attributes, God is the blessed and only sovereign, and the uniqueness of the relationship between God and his attributes. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. In appropriating the ordinary grammar of creaturely naming, scripture conveys that God alone is light, that God is identical with light, and that God is nothing but light. In predicating things of God, scripture thus refuses to locate God within a larger class of gods, or within a larger category of being that would include both God and creatures. Now there's something that you said here about Elohim and Theos and how these are used in the ancient world and even in scripture, um, but time prohibits it. The same goes for scriptural evaluations of God. God's name is extolled as unique and incomparable. Thus, 1 Samuel 2.2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, there is no rock like our rock. According to the Old Testament and the New, God's name alone is to be hallowed in heaven and on earth. Here we may agree again with Brueggemann that God's uniqueness and incomparability is the extreme and most sweeping testimony given to Yahweh in Holy Scripture. What about the scope of divine naming? Scripture praises God's unsearchable greatness by means of an abundance of divine names. And the tradition offers a number of ways of categorizing these, this abundance of names, and I want to observe just a few of these. Gregory of Nazianzus regards he who is and God as names that, in a special way, signify God's being. He adds to this categorization two other distinct groups of names, which signify God's power on the one hand and God's providential ordering on the other. The first group includes names such as Almighty and King, King of the Ages, King of the Forces, King of the Rulers, and so forth. The second group includes God of our salvation, God of justice, peace, and so forth. Adding a point essential to pro-Nicene theology, Gregory then distinguishes between the preceding names of God, which are shared by the three persons of the Trinity, and the personal names by which the three persons are distinguished from one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Augustine offers a similar scheme of categorization. Having ruled out eight of Aristotle's 10 categories as irrelevant to the discussion of divine names, and by the way, anytime someone says the fathers are, are, are kind of beholden to Aristotle, I, I, I wonder if they've read the fathers, right? Augustine goes through Aristotle's categories and finds them quite unsuitable for talking about God. But, but he does say two can at least be used. And, and these two become the two most important categories of divine names for Augustine for much of the tradition that follows him. Here is that various names of God can be said of him either substance-wise or relation-wise. The former category of names refers to what all three persons of the Trinity hold in common as the one God. The latter category, like Gregory, refers to the ways in which the three persons of the Trinity are distinguished from one another, but he also adds that names said relation-wise refer to uh, the ways in which the one God relates to creators, to creatures, I'm sorry, as creator, Lord, and King. Augustine's scheme of categorization becomes so categorical for treatments of the divine names in the broader Augustinian tradition, 
whether it's Lombard or Aquinas, so much so that when Richard of St. Victor fails to address one aspect of the scheme for the sake of space, he has to apologize for leaving it unaddressed. The reformers and Protestant Orthodox continued to employ these and other schemes of categorizing the divine names, adding certain refinements to the discussion of God's relative names that are worth mentioning, if only for the deep pastoral significance. Luther talks about God's friendly names and includes under this title the name shepherd. And the reformed tradition describes God's federal names, names that refer to God's covenant relationship with us. Those names described by possessive pronouns, that the Lord is our God and so forth. And there's much rich spiritual treatment of these in the tradition. What then about the ends of divine naming? I mentioned three. The first end of divine naming is hermeneutical. According to Gerhard, our theology in this life is almost completely grammatical. If this is so, then one end of the study of divine names must be to gain greater fluency, both in interpreting and expressing the biblical grammar of divine naming. We study the divine names in order that we may move beyond mere reading of the sacred page to an understanding of the way the words go. We study the divine names in order that we may move beyond mere repetition of biblical words and orthodox creeds to the ability to speak fluently of God in our own context of prayer, proclamation, and praise. And I suggest that the the category of fluency is is a way of capturing the, the distinction common in treatments of the divine names between the ability to comprehend God, which the tradition says we, we, have, we do not have that ability, and the ability to apprehend God. See, a, a child can learn to follow a tune before she ever knows any musical theory or the mathematics that supports that music theory. Right? A child can learn to play baseball before he ever understands the physics that, that make baseball possible. So we, though we do not know God as God knows God, can nevertheless have a true apprehension of him. We, we can learn to sing his praise by becoming fluent in biblical grammar of divine naming. So the first end is hermeneutical, the second end is formational. The word of God in Holy Scripture is given to us that it might be implanted in our hearts, James says. The implanted word both conveys and forms within us spiritual habits, various forms of intellectual and moral excellence that are essential to the knowledge and love of God. The study of the divine names thus has a formational end. As we seek to gain greater fluency in interpreting and expressing the divine names revealed to us in scripture, we also pray that the divine names will renew our minds and that they will plant the highways to Zion in our hearts, leading us upward to the one in whom alone our souls may find their everlasting rest. The third end of the divine names and of the study of the divine names is doxological. The Leiden Synopsis, a 17th century manual of Reformed doctrine, brings its brief but penetrating analysis of the divine names and attributes of God to a conclusion with the directive that we must acknowledge only him, and we must bless, honor, worship, and serve only him, and adore, praise, invoke, and glorify him in words and deeds. This is actually the goal and purpose of knowing God. More recently, Robert Jensen put it this way, The church has a mission to see the speaking of the gospel, whether to the world as message of salvation or to God in appeal and praise. Theology is the reflection internal to the church's labor on this assignment. Well, in both cases, Leiden Synopsis and Jensen, the final end of theological reflection on the divine names is rightly identified. God has revealed his holy name in Holy Scripture that we, gaining fluency, in and being formed by his holy name, may with everything that have breath, bless his holy name. I wanna conclude with some thoughts on how this can help us both understand and apply Psalm 145. Psalm 145 is the only psalm in the entire Psalter that has the title of the Psalter. That is, it's titled as a psalm. And Psalm 145 is located in an interesting position in relationship to the last psalms 
of the book of Psalms, which are sometimes known as the hallelujah, hallelujah chorus, calling all things in heaven and earth to praise the Lord. And so Psalm 146 is, as it were, the, the warm-up, the, the entryway into Psalm 146 through 50. Psalm 145 is also an acrostic poem. Each line begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet and thus presents itself to us as the perfection of divine praise. Here's what it means to praise God from A to Z. Well, Psalm 45 has, has two themes. The first theme is the greatness of the Lord. Great is the Lord, and abundantly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And the psalmist reflects on the greatness of God's majesty. He reflects upon the greatness of God's goodness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. He reflects on the, the greatness of God's kingdom, which is an everlasting kingdom, whose dominion endures to all generations. And in doing so, he ascribes praise to God with, with an almost unlimited resource and stock of, of nouns and verbs and adjectives. This is God's name fully uttered. But I want to note the, the second theme of Psalm 145, because it is so helpful for thinking about uh, the importance of this study. The second theme of Psalm 145 concerns the psalmist's own commitment to divine praise. If the first theme is the greatness of the Lord, the second theme is the greatness of the psalmist's commitment to praising the great Lord. The second theme is the magnanimous self-commitment of the psalmist. Psalm 145 begins with, with, with a pledge, with a commitment. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and bless your name forever and ever. He goes on to describe how he will ensure that future generations will give their praise to God. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, I will meditate. One generation shall proclaim your works to another, declare your mighty acts. And the psalm concludes with, with a wish of the psalmist, which I think he sees himself as in part playing a role in fulfilling. That let every, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. You see, the psalmist understands that the greatness of the Lord is worthy of a great self-commitment from his people, a great commitment to praise. Well, I think this is a helpful reminder in the study of the divine names. For while the study of the divine names does call for moderation, a not stepping over the bounds of what has been revealed, it also calls for magnanimity. Of course, we are aware of our weakness and our inability to fulfill this magnanimous calling. However, our hope for fulfilling this calling doesn't lie in ourselves, but in the triumph of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and in the seven spirits of God he has sent out into all the earth. In Jesus' name, and by his spirit, we may take all the glorious names ascribed to God in Psalm 145, and indeed in all of scripture, on our lips, and join the blood-bought kingdom of priests in leading the everlasting chorus of all creatures in heaven and on earth and the sea and all its depths to bless his holy name. Thank you. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.